culture. I'm just going to read a bit in Acts chapter 2, and I promise I won't be before you long. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Someone say a sound from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Someone say it filled the whole house. Part of revival culture, there is the filling of the whole house where the children are impacted. I love you, Silas. Where the children are impacted. From the front to the side, someone say the whole house. We've experienced that on tonight. The baby came up to say, who's the white lady with the wings above the church? Come on, someone say the whole house, the whole house. And they appeared unto them. Someone say there will always be an appearance in revival culture. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set down upon each of them. And they were all filled. Someone say all filled. Come on to Apostle Dwayne's revelation even in this moment concerning that God had something for everyone. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, someone say noised abroad. Come on, revival will always be noised abroad noised abroad. The multitude came. Someone say the multitude will always come to revival. Come on, it'll come to the atmosphere. It will come to the revival culture. And we're confounded because that every man heard them speak his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, and in Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, uh, and Ph Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Out of the revival culture will be declared the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and, and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. Come on, AJ, and your young men shall see visions. Come on, AJ, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's some things that I want to draw out of what we just read that will be part of our revival culture. 
It is not just for us to have an experience every couple of years, even of prolonged worship nights, even of prolonged miracles, but it is supposed to be the culture of the New Testament church. And as we build and establish Destiny Global, it will be our culture. Someone say, it will be our culture. Come on, in Acts 2, 5, and 6, out of this culture will always come a universal experience. So we do not have to go to the gimmicks of church planting. Come on, hear me, and bless the strategies. But out of the presence of God, out of hosting him, out of making room for him, out of praying and fasting, come on, out of seeking his face will always come a universal experience. Out of that encounter, people from different tribes and tongues were drawn to one spot. They heard out of the sound, out of the movement, the language that connected to their culture. Out of this house will always come a language. Come on, out of this movement will always come a language that will connect people wherever they are. That language can be business, that language can be education, that language can be arts and entertainment, but out of the revival culture will always come a universal experience. Someone say a universal experience. So we don't have to compromise the kingdom to reach a person. We don't have to compromise the kingdom to reach a place. We do not have to comp compromise the kingdom to reach a certain plateau. Someone say universal experience. And in that, come on, and in that, there will always be voices of explanation. Someone say universal experience and voices of explanation. Out of that moment, Peter had to stand up and bring an explanation. There will always be in revival culture a voice that rises to give language to the region concerning what God is doing. And that voice can be yours. Come on, come on. As you are a carrier of this revival culture, I don't want to go too far, there will always be a voice pointing to the ancient truths for the present expression, pointing us into our future. What happened in that moment, in that experience, was the setting up of the church universal. Do you hear that? It was the setting up of the church universal. And there was language that came in order to bring direction and explanation concerning what God was doing. Someone say, in revival culture, there will be voices of explanation. And hear me, it is not about good church. Someone say, it's not about good church. Come on, it's about salvation and transformation. If our goals are anything other than that, we are trying to have a good service to grow our church. It will be and will produce um, salvation and transformation. We see that in Acts 2.21. It says, and anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so in this, we have to consider these dynamics of revival culture, and then we have to compare it to what we've seen in our days. Wise men will take a look back, uh, uh, survey where they are, and then peer into the future. Someone say, take a look back, okay? Survey where we are and peer into the future. Come on, if you're a wise man, you're going to consider the history, okay? If you're a wise man, you're going to consider your presence, you're going to present, you're going to survey what's happening, and then you're, you're going to position yourself to peer into the future. Someone say past, present, and future, all wrapped up in revival culture. The history, your history with God, where you currently are and wrapped in that moment is the DNA for our future. Someone say, build from the culture. And so if we were to take a moment to do what my wise men do, someone say, we have to do what wise men would do. We would take a look at some of the patterns of the historical revivals that have happened across our land and lands beyond America. And when you take a look at those revivals, you see that they were sustained for a period of time, and then something happened. Someone say something happened. 
okay? And if we're wise, we have to draw from that information in order to assist us with securing what God is doing now so we can build a culture versus experiencing a moment. Is that okay to say? Okay, is that okay to say? So some of the dynamics of the, the, uh, the, the, the things that took place that stole revival from regions, from people and from houses, some of the common things that have been identified as sin, you hear that? Sin, pride, sin, pride, and then a lack of continued fellowship. So if, we're, if we are to sustain this culture so that you do not come in here and experience dry moments in Destiny Global. Someone say, no dry moments. Come on, y'all got to hear me. Let me say it over here. No dry moments. That's why we'll spend time in prayer. Come on, hear me. That's why we'll spend time fasting. That's why we'll spend time in the word. Because we want to ensure that it is a culture and not just something that we're trying to catch. Someone say, it's our culture. Come on, we're not catching a cold. It's our culture. Come on, it's our culture. And so those lessons from history can assist us with understanding what it takes to steward a revival culture. So I want to come and show you an example of stewarding revival culture. Let me just grab this. And I want to talk about the importance of stewarding revival culture because, again, if we are considering uh, the fact that this is cultural and that it was God's original intent, come on, someone say, and it was. Come on, it was, it was God's original intent, intent. Then we must understand that if we are believing for a significant, uh, um, the saving of souls and out of revival culture comes the significant saving of souls, which then transforms the region. We struggle with what's happening in our cities, our towns, and our communities, and we keep trying to legislate our way out. There is no way to legislate ourselves out of a heart condition. Men will be wicked and the land will stay wicked without the transformative work of Jesus Christ in the hearts of men. We can vote, but we will not experience significant transformation apart from revival culture reaching the hearts of men. And so if you want city transformation, there has to be revival culture somewhere in the city. I can prove it. I'm just going to talk about some of the historical context where what happened and the byproduct of those revivals. I'm going to start here with the Great Awakening. Let me back up. Yep, I'm going to start here with the Great Awakening. This was in 1734 to, through 43. Um, and this broke out in um, Northampton, Massachusetts, where a young Jonathan Edwards was a pastor. After months of fruitless labor, he reported five or six people converted, one a young woman. He wrote she has been one of the greatest company keepers in the whole town. Y'all get the company keepers? Sounds like Jesus, you have five husbands and the one you with is not yours, okay? He feared her conversion would douse the flame, but quite the opposite took place. 300 souls converted in six months in a town of only 1,100 people. The news spread like wildfire and similar revivals broke out in over 100 towns starting in Philadelphia in 1739. What eventually happened, an estimated 80% of America's 900,000 colonists personally heard uh, George Whitfield preach, okay? And he became one of America's most identifying or identifiable revivalists, okay? I'm going to keep going. The Second Great Awakening, 1800 to 1840, all right, only one in 15 of America's population of 5.3 million belong to an evangelical church. 
Presbyterian minister James McGreedy presided over strange spiritual manifestations in Logan County. The resulting camp meeting revivals drew thousands from, far, from as far away as Ohio, okay? Um, they reported that for the next 25 years, not a single month passed without news of revival somewhere. Someone say somewhere. In 1824, Charles Finney began a career that would eventually convert 500,000 to Christ. An unparalleled 100,000 were converted in Rochester, New York. In 1831 alone, causing the revival to spread to 1,500 towns, okay? By 1850, the nation's population exploded fourfold to 23 million people. But those connected to evangelical churches grew nearly tenfold from 7% to 13% of the population, okay? So that growth, we started with 350,000 and converting to three million. Revival culture transforms lives, what transforms cities. So if we are to steward what God wants to do, and listen, that is the culture of the kingdom. Some would say revival culture is the culture of the kingdom. So if we have anything else, we're not truly experiencing the full culture of the kingdom. This is what it was supposed to be. That's what happened in Acts. The connection came with other men. They went into their towns and their cities, and the church started to live. We are charged with the same charge in 2023 Destiny Global. It is not a service. Someone say, it is not a service. It is our culture. And so if as a movement we are not going to fizzle out, but we'll have the true kingdom culture, which is revival culture, then we have to make sure as men we are doing our part. So then how do we ensure that we enable our lives to house and disperse revival culture. It requires us to continue to be discipled. I know what. You don't hear people connecting discipleship to revival. It is the key. In order to have mass transformation, you have to have mass discipleship. <laughs> Did you hear the lives that were transformed? It wasn't just a tick mark. I'm telling you, society started to look different in those cities. Come on, we still even have the Bible Belt. You think it's not real? Remnants of those days. And so as a house that will be tasked, is tasked from heaven to not have a revival night just by itself, but to have a revival culture, then we have to be good stewards of our lives connected to this movement. I know it's not about just praying. It's about living what you pray. It's not just about coming to Bible study, but it's about being living epistles read by men. It's about our decisioning, lining up with the word of God. Come on. It is about discipleship. We cannot have a successful revival culture without discipleship, which is why we do a foundations class. What in the world? You're apostolic and prophetic house. Yes, but this is about transformation. Someone say discipleship is required. The outcome of revival culture will be transformation, but we have to keep the main thing the main thing. It's more than coming here and having a touch and getting healed. How do I live after I walk out of here to maintain my liberty and my freedom? And so if we are to have a revival culture, it requires men to be good stewards. Much of what has been sparked by heaven has been poured out or um, 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 abandoned by men. And so it's sparked by heaven, but it gets doused by men. 
And so then we have this revival spark that is not able to continue to catch flame and to move from heart to heart and breast to breast because of the container of man. And so God continues to pour, but if, and let me just do it this way, if this container represents our lives and it's not transparent, and God is pouring, no one can truly experience what he's pouring as a result of the structure of the vessel. Because the reality is, is that at this point, no one knows how much water is being contained. Because the structure of the life that's containing it, it has nowhere else to go. And so there's downloads, there's revelation, there's truth, there's grace, there's love all being poured in. But this life that's stewarding, there's no way for it to get out of it into the territory. And so the land remains dry, but we had good church. So I feel good because I had a revival experience, but it, go no, it goes no further than me because of my life. Because when I get to work, you know, they put it at me, I'm gonna give it back to them. And so he pours out revival, come on in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, but it cannot get to the territory because of the condition of the lives that is holding what he's pouring. And so there was a measure that was assigned to Baltimore, but the condition of the stewards of the move caused it not to get out into the city. And so he sparks revival. Again, in another territory and so he comes in Philadelphia, and it's a little bit better in the lives that are stewarding revival. And you can see, oh, something is happening in the church of Philadelphia. The water levels, come on, this is the language we use, the water levels are rising. Oh, God is up to something. God is up to something. He's pouring and the water levels are rising but it's just for this one side and this one group because we cannot join up with anybody else. Because mm -mm, we don't do it like they do it. And so there's not the ability to have confluence because although we're letting him have his way, we refuse to come together. And so it's not really the church of Philadelphia, it's our church on the corner. And so we still don't have the fullness of what we can experience. But God pouring, pouring, and the water levels rising because of the condition of the stewards of revival. And so we have revelation that's been emptied. <laughs> we have ruins. Come on, you know what that looks like. Ruins in a church when nobody even shows up anymore. But we used to have a high time. Ooh, that was such a great time. Because of the stewards of revival. And so if we can indeed provide a level of death, <laughs> we don't want to talk about it, where I lose my opinion and Christ can get in, where I make different decisions according to the word of God 
and it's no longer just me because there is not much of a difference between this because it's the same color. We had the same color, but a different surrender. And so as stewards of revival, it can't be enough just to show up at revival night. We have to be stewards of our lives to make room for Christ to move through us into the region. And so these two baskets, they look similar. I mean, the same shape, the same color, but their surrender is different. Their discipline is different. And so this is all about me, but this is all about him. And so he can gain access to the parts that I previously did not give him access to. Come on, come on, come on. I, 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 can, I can surrender my desires, and I didn't want to surrender it last year. But I've been sitting in the presence of God, and so it's caused me to become pliable in his hand. Come on, I've been sitting in his word, and it reminded me that my life is not my own. Come on, we don't talk about being crucified with Christ anymore. But if we are to be successful stewards of the revival move, then we have to live disciplined lives. And what happens when we live disciplined lives is that our lives become a framework for the expansion of the kingdom. And so we become framework. We become framework. I mean, we are his handiwork created in good wor works for good works. And in a large house... There are vessels of wood and of earthenware, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. But if you will shun youthful lust, you will be a vessel of honor, fit and prepared for every good work. And so sometimes it's not about what God wants to do. Sometimes it's about our stewardship of what he's pouring and we pray, pour it out, Father. But we don't allow it to transform us or to get through us. And so what if we can change our concept of keepers of revival? Where it's not just, sorry, y'all, I got a new phone and I don't know what to do with it. It's not just about one moment. But it's about all moments. What if it's not just about what I want, but it's about what he wants? What if our stewardship can expand of our lives and we make room for more than a revival night, but a culture? What if... We say, now I'm going to do it his way. What if we surrender ourselves and we truly come together? What if more than one church comes to prayer night for the city? <laughs> what if we rock the status quo? What if it's not just about my church numbers? What if it's, oh, what if, what if we decide that we're, what if we decide that we're going to really truly come to a place of confluence where what God is doing in my church and what God is doing in your church is not about our four walls, but it's about the city. What if the container of our programs, the container of our, our personal objectives for the church, what if we abandon them all? I can say no to myself. I can say no to my church structure so that the thing that God desires to do can spread and can impact 
other areas to the point where to the point where there are no limits. Pastor Dad, it is a towel down here to this revival culture and the people and the city and the region get to experience the poor. Revival culture is about the transparency of the poor. Come on, I will pour out my spirit upon all The flesh shouldn't be the problem. The flesh shouldn't be the problem. He really does desire to pour it out on all flesh. It's just our place of surrender. What if on the day of Pentecost, they ignored the language? What if on the day of Pentecost, they were not available? What if... They decided that it was just for this one revival service. And it really wasn't about cultural revolution. What if they kept it in the temple? That was the old model. Do you know that? The presence set in the temple. The old model. What if we allow our lives to be open, our programs to be open to the end that what he pours does what it has been intended to do. So we can give up our agenda. We can give up our protected lives. Where no, I can't tell you what's going on in my business. So that true discipleship can take place place to the end that we started looking like this pretty cloudy <laughs> no transparency where we started to allow the discipleship process that is connected to revival be made manifest in our lives until we continue to die another death to the ultimate place where it's not just about people being able to see a little bit of Christ, but it's about them being to able to gain access to him through me. We have an opportunity here at Destiny Global Church. It's very similar to what has been extended in historical moments before. Can we be the next point of revival in our nation? Can we be the next point of revival in our city? Can we be the next point of transformation where the kingdom gets introduced to the heathen? Or are we going to stay in a place where we are not truly open where we pray for open heavens, but we don't open our lives. This is about revival culture. He's not just pouring it in for us. There's supposed to be a corresponding output. If he pours it in, there should be a corresponding output. It's the model. Come on, Acts 2. It's the model of kingdom culture. And so on tonight, my assignment is to task us with responsible stewardship of revival culture. Where we do not leave out the component of discipleship. Where we do not leave out the component of living as dead men. Where we do not leave out the component of the unity that's required for city transformation. Where we do not leave out the components that are necessary for it to be more than a flame but a citywide fire. Come on, I want a wildfire. 
come on. I don't just want a candle. You ever seen the church services where they come with one candle? Burn the whole thing down, Father. You ever seen a fire take place? What happens? The people in the neighborhood come outside. Y'all know y'all seen those movies where the fire starts and sis got her robe. Y'all never seen those movies? I want it to be so hot that the neighbors come out to see what God is doing. Come on, I want it to be such an enormous light coming from our movement that the city is drawn to the light. Come on, I want it to be a culture and not just a service. So that anytime we come together, anything can happen. Come on. So that anytime we come together, we have the characteristics of Christ. Come on. We see people healed. Come on. We see, we see blind eyes open. We see deaf ears open. Come on. I want this movement, according to the will of God, to be a culture and not a service. And so if we are indeed to be that, then the stewardship of our lives, we have to. And I I chose this basket because I was just going to, y'all know I was out looking for stuff. I was just going to get something that was really more open. But I wanted to celebrate the fact that he chose the disciples. He knew that they had unique personalities. He knew that they had unique skill set. And it was beneficial to what he was doing. Paul and Peter were different, but they were beneficial in their assignment. And so I wanted to choose this because even as we become him, he chose Misha for a purpose. And Misha's framework, come on, she has been fearfully and wonderfully made so that that which is assigned to hit to the earth through her has a specific pattern. There's a specific experience. And I'm telling you that as we come to this place of divine surrender, we do not have to look the same because there was this distinct language that happened. They were going to different people that they heard the sound. Your uniqueness will be a positive in revival culture. Do not surrender who you've been called to be to look like everyone else. Carry your your uniqueness and carry the culture. Come on, stand on your feet. Hallelujah. We have to marry intention with our experience. Please hear me when I say that. We have to marry intention with our experience. It's not just about the emotionalism of the encounter, but it's about the stewardship of the intention of heaven. We will be intentional about creating space for the presence of God to touch men's hearts. Hallelujah. We will be intentional about living the life of surrender so that pride and sin does not uh, uh, smother out the fire and the flame of God in our movement and in our work. We will be intentional about disciplining ourselves and learning more about the Word of God than we do about movies. Come on, we will be intentional about disciplining ourselves concerning the fruit of the Spirit. Come on, having self-control. Come on, we will be disciplined enough to allow Holy Spirit to do the work on the inside of us so that He removes the dross so the reflection of Christ can be seen in me. Come on, would you lift your hands? Father, Destiny Global, this movement, we are committed to your intention concerning kingdom culture, which is revival culture. We are intentional about dying. Hallelujah. We are intentional about picking up our cross and following you so that that which you have assigned to be extended in the earth through this movement will not be crushed by the flesh of men. We will be living sacrifices. Hallelujah. Holy and acceptable unto you. Hallelujah. We present ourselves. We present our minds. We present our thoughts. We present our desires to you, Father. And we place them on the altar of your will. We say yes to the holy exchange. (laughs) 
Let the fire hit our lives and then let it hit the city. Let the fire hit our lives and then let it hit this region. Let the fire hit our lives and then let it hit the nation. Father, we will indeed be carriers of the poor. We will not hoard it for a church experience, but we will release it through our lives for kingdom transformation and expansion. Father, we thank you that we will not be confined to the American structure of the church, but we thank you that this movement, we will be in every mountain of society. We thank you that this movement will carry your presence into the four corners of the earth. Nothing is off limits for you through our lives, Father. Where you tell us to go, we will go. What you tell us to say, we will say. If you want a healing service on our jobs, God, we say yes. If you want to release the word in the grocery store, Father, we say yes. Lord, send revival and let it begin in us. Oh, let it begin in us. Let it begin in us. We pray, Father, that our mindsets of what revival should look like, that they shift, and that our lives will be the container of your glory. Hallelujah. So much so, Father, that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. We want the harvest, hallelujah, that's in this city. <laughs> we want the harvest that's in this nation. Father, we want, Lord God, revival culture. We ask that you would allow us to prune ourselves. Hallelujah. Daily, Father. Not in our own strength, but in your strength. Hallelujah. For your grace is sufficient. For your strength is made perfect in our weakness. We stand complete in your righteousness, Father. We thank you that there is fruit and evidence of Holy Spirit living in our lives. We thank you that we will not be a fad, but the kingdom culture, revival culture will be present in this movement, and we give you access to our lives, to the end, Father, that your presence hits the people, the places for your divine purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, would you clap your hands and tell the Lord yes. Come on, will you clap your hands and tell the Lord yes? Come on, I say yes to you, your purpose over my pride. Come on, I say yes, I say yes to your call over my convenience. Come on, I say yes to your purpose over my plan. Come on, I say yes to allowing you to touch the earth through me. Come on, this is not about a church service, but this is about a life of revival. Come on, this is not about a Sunday morning or a Friday night or a Saturday conference or a five-day experience. It is about our lives being hidden in Christ, allowing the manifest presence of God to transform the land that we stand in. Come on, would you celebrate God for our charge on tonight, and let's honor our apostle as he comes to take us further. Come on, celebrate that word tonight. You can do better than that. Celebrate that word tonight. Were you blessed tonight? Hallelujah. We believe that we have heard from heaven tonight. Uh, earlier than today, the Lord started talking to me about discipline and stewardship. And I was sitting with him and even looking and assessing my own life, saying, all right, God, what do I need to align and what do I need to pivot to ensure that I am in alignment with what he wants to do in my life and my family's life through this movement. And so I believe that inspection, and it brings us also into an invitation to prepare ourselves for what's coming. I text uh, Elder Designate Jerrica, and I said to her, I said, you know, I really believe that Destiny Global has what's necessary to build the move of God in the earth, and that ain't smoke, y'all. Like, I really, really, really believe it, and she said, we're ready for it. And so I believe that we are right where we need to be on the timetable of God. But there is a requirement from us. As Apostle Cheryl said, we don't want to be those that just spark something for the sake of sparking it, but not but then see it die and 
fizzle out. That's, that's not what we want to build. But how do we build something in the earth that's transformational and it maintains? That's what we're after. We're after longevity. And so we're willing to go the long route because we want to build something that has eternal significance. And so I believe that tonight was a night of invitation and a night of inspection that we've got to inspect our personal lives. We've got to inspect the house. And we've got to ensure that we are ready for what it is that God wants to pour out on us. There's something coming, y'all, for our movement. There's something coming. Um, we never have had a desire. I was telling Teray the other day, we were uh, out eating. I said, we, we are not good church planters. That's not what we are. I don't even think we're called to do that. What we are called to do is build a movement. Build a movement and build a stronghold for God in the earth. And we're right where we need to be, but we've got to receive the invitation that is upon us. Are y'all ready? Are y'all with us? Are y'all ready to build this with us? I, okay. Okay. I heard a couple of people. Y'all ready to build this with us? Uh, God's going to do it. Are you raising the offering? Do you do it? Are you supposed to? Tell me. Y'all tell me what's going on. Okay. Come on, celebrate Misha as she comes. This is our, it's not the best part of service because we had a wonderful word today. So this is the part where everyone can participate. So we're going to stand as Mari is going to walk down the center aisle with envelopes as we do offering. Okay, the ways to give are on the screen. And I also just want to reiterate that we are preparing for our destiny summit. Y'all can be a little more excited than that. We're having destiny summit. So we also want to encourage everybody to still sow into that. And if you do, just make a note of it that this is for Destiny Summit, okay? So I'm going to give everybody a few moments just to collect. We'll gather their offering, okay? Um, yes, and the options are on the screen. All right. If everyone has been given the opportunity to sow, we're just going to pray over offering. Father, we thank you for the ability to sow into good ground. We thank you for the ability to sow a seed and name it and claim a harvest, Father. Thank you that you are the God who blesses us mightily. You are the God who pours out onto his people. And yes, we are those who steward the finances of the kingdom well. For yes, Father, you have called us to be those who are wells of economy, to not contain what you give us, but to spread it out into the kingdom, Father. So we thank you for all of those who have sown into Destiny Summit and have sown into Destiny Global Church. Thank you for the harvest attached to their sowing. Thank you for the harvest attached to their sacrifice. Thank you for the harvest attached to their surrender. Thank you for the harvest attached to the yes in this space. So Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are going to continuously show up in their businesses. We thank you you're going to show up in their jobs. We thank you you're going to show up in their schools and in their communities. Thank you that you are going to show the mighty hand of God in every endeavor they embark upon in your name. And we praise you in advance for what you are doing in this year, people. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe this. Come on, let's stand to pray out. Hallelujah. Listen. As Misha said, our Destiny Summit is right around the corner. And um, yeah, yeah, because tied to that, y'all, it's our three-year anniversary. We're turning three years old. Hallelujah. And God has been faithful. And uh, as Pastor Sheldon and I, we've continuously said we sent something special on this year. So we definitely want you to be present. We want you to register for Saturday session. Hallelujah. We want you to register, uh, but we want you to invite someone as well. Every night, we want you to invite someone, invite 12,000 people. I don't know how you're going to do it. Ask God for the supernatural, but we want you to invite 12,000 people every night. We want to pack the place out, and we believe that God is going to do something absolutely phenomenal. Help me celebrate Mama Witherspoon, who's in the room tonight. We love you, Mama Witherspoon. It's good to see you. 
Come on, let's be this. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for our time together. We thank you that this is a house that houses the presence of God. Thank you. We don't take it lightly that you meet us when we gather. We don't take it lightly that we experience your presence, that we experience breakthrough, that we experience power. We don't take it lightly. And so we're grateful tonight to have experienced you. And we thank you that we will steward what it is that we've heard and that we've received. Hallelujah. And that we would carry this in our personal lives so that it would impact the world around us. Now, beloved, I pray above all things that these your people would prosper and that they would be in health even as their souls prosper. Angels encamp around about them and keep them in the way that they should go. And may no hurt, harm, or danger come nigh their dwelling is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hug somebody on your, out, on your way out. You are dismissed. <laughs>